What should I call you during this interview? Should I use your real name or your alias? Yael, Ella? Not Ella, not Yael, not... You can call me Tamar. Tamar, okay. You served in an operations unit of the Mossad called Kesaria. Yes. What does this job of a Mossad operative require? I think being an operative is being a tool for storytelling. And the stories always need to work on two levels. The story you tell yourself, why you're doing this, what you're going to do, and the story you're prepared to tell the world, which is the story that you never tell. Because when you get to the point where you'll have to tell the story, you're already done. You have to get to a point where you're transmitting the story, the props you walk around with, your behavior, the things you do, are all being registered in the eyes of the person that looks at you. He's thinking, he's looking, he's saying, wait a minute, who's that? What is she here for? Oh, yes, of course. Go ahead. And what happens if your cover story is blown? Well, if I were caught, then uh, I don't know if it would have ended with prison time. I don't know. Because being an Israeli spy is not a nice thing in an enemy country. It's, it's not recommended. The work takes you across most of Europe. You're not at home for most of the week. The kids in the family are back home. And at the same time, you are busy with your work under a different identity. And to keep these two worlds totally separate, the world of the theater on one hand, because you are actually a theater actor, not for a two-hour play between seven and nine, but for hours upon hours, hours and days. Is it really like theater? It's not theater in the classical sense of the word, but it's, uh, I would say, a system for acting with assigned roles. Everyone knows exactly what they need to do. You get one shot at this play. And you need to be convinced that the volume of X's acting, coupled with Y's timing in entering the scene, coupled with the specific lines, will eventually achieve the goal, which is the audience clapping their hands and I'm using a big metaphor here, right? And then you take a bow meaning you've achieved your goal. They recruited me because I was a good actress. They recruited me because I had a knack for languages. They recruited me because I was intelligent enough to deal with morphing situations and because I had the ability to respond properly at any given moment. 
They recruited me because it's usually easier for a man and a woman to stand on a street corner than for a man or a woman to stand there alone. That's why they recruited me. When I joined the service, I was 26, fresh out of the Sayoret Matkal. And like everyone else, I was at a crossroad. I was looking for what to do next. And when, when they approached me, it resonated with me, very much even. It resonated with the way I saw myself in the mirror. When I looked in the mirror, what did I want to see? I wanted to see this. They asked me to come for an interview. I had a short interview with a pretty girl which caused me to want to be part of this organization very much. And soon after that, I did a, a series of, of personality tests to see if you're the kind of personality or person that is a good fit for this kind of job, for a secret agent. Did your time in Sayeret Matkal help you? Serving in a special unit such as Sayeret Matkal or other special forces has no bearing on whether or not you will have success as a Mossad operative. One of the all-time best operatives we had was previously a gas technician serving in, uh, in the intelligence corps. Serving in units such as the Air Force, being a pilot in the Air Force, can even be a disadvantage because these are people who grew up with a very tight structure. So their ability to think creatively and outside the box is somewhat mixed. I hope an Air Force pilot won't kill me because I've said that. So uh, you need to be a maverick to be very creative, but you can't be a loony. It's true that most people who are borderline crazy are much more creative people. You can see evidence of this with some of the world's best artists. A lot of them, they were all a little crazy. An organization such as ours cannot tolerate that. And so you have to find the, those people who possess that freedom of mind, that imagination, who are capable of seeing other worlds, but at the same time are very sane and know exactly what they're doing. I grew up in a small European town. France is very conservative. Growing up in an all-girls school with only female teachers has a feeling of a place that will never change. They always made sure that I felt as if I didn't belong. They always asked me, um, in case of a conflict between Israel and France, which side would you be on? Where would your loyalty lie? In 1970, the law in France was changed and the age of maturity dropped from 21 to 18. I said, that's it. Bye-bye. I grabbed a suitcase and came to Israel. That was the kind of girl I was. I knew what I wanted, I knew what I didn't want. And I began a completely normal life. Until one day, I received a letter from the Bureau of International Cooperation. I arrived at a room with a, a table and a man. He said to me, if I tell you that there is a job that our pilots can't do, that our paratroopers can't do, and that you can to serve as the eyes and ears of this country in foreign lands, would you be interested? I said, of course. Didn't you consider the risks? No. Would you have decided differently today? I don't think so. Okay, so what should I call you in this interview? Janet. Janet? If you want to call me Sarah, I can be Sarah for five minutes, no problem. When I was young, I loved all kinds of suspense novels, crime novels, and Agatha Christie. I would always ruin all of the movies for my friends, because by the time the second scene was over, I already knew who the killer was. I like mysteries. I like solving mysteries. I like to participate in mysteries, okay? 
was 1970. I lived in Israel. I was young and very confused. And I signed up to night school at the Israel Institute of Technology to study systems analysis and programming. They put us in a class, and in front of me sat a very handsome man. And it was the middle of the winter. Everybody's lily white, but this guy's got a tan. So the semester began, and every so often, the guy would disappear and then reappear after two weeks with an even better tan and a smile from ear to ear, happy as a clam, a real enigma. After about the third or fourth time this happened, I took a pencil, I sharpened it and sharpened it until it had a really sharp, pointy tip, touched it right here, to his artery, and I told him, listen, I have no idea what you're up to, but I want some too. And that's how I ended up in the Mossad. They test your resourcefulness, your improvisation skills, your courage. If you're too courageous, you're out. Because a person who's bold and brave and fearless can't pick up the right cues in the field. They won't be able to tell when danger is approaching. On the one hand, you have to be uh, trustworthy, ethical, moral. And on the other hand, you have to have the ability in certain situations to be someone else based on what the situation is. Uh, and so the combination of these two qualities, it's hard to find them in the same person. Basically, you're either an honest and ethical person or you're a crook. It's very hard to be both honest and ethical and then turn into a crook when the need arises. In your day-to-day -day operations, you have to live deep inside this world, sometimes for extended periods of time, where you are forced to manipulate in ways you never would in the real world. That, that's the game. That's why it's so hard to find operatives, why only one in a thousand fits the bill. During your training, were you treated differently because you were a woman? Well, I arrived after 68 from France, which had bra-burning women. So the image of the French girl in those days brought up questions regarding promiscuity, the willingness to play along, and regarding my own limits as to what degree I would be able to stay disciplined. On one hand, they didn't want to turn me into a nun. On the other hand, they didn't want me to get in trouble. There were certain times during the training where they simply decided to test me in this aspect. I had a boyfriend, and they asked me to break up with him. They had to check my ability to follow orders, a quality that isn't readily obvious with me and to follow through on what I said I'd do, that we'd break up and not see each other anymore. He was very upset with it, but I was very determined. As someone who stood at the top of the pyramid of the Mossad, how involved were you in the personal lives of the operatives? I'll tell you a story about one of the men, but won't tell you who it was. He was a key figure in one of the operations that was about to take place. And he came to me and said, listen, I have to go overseas for three days. I said, yeah, there's an operation. Fine, I'll be back. And he calls me from overseas and says, I'm so sorry, Ephraim, I'm not coming back. What happened? I found the love of my life. We're about to head out on a catamaran. I said, but you know, there's an operation. He said, I'm sorry, I can't. I put the phone down at 2 a.m. and my wife Hadassah says to me, what happened? You're as white as a ghost. And I postponed the operation. And I didn't tell the director of the Mossad about it. Because if I had told the head of the Mossad, the head of the Mossad would be obligated to see to it that he was never involved in operations again. 
And the entire nation of Israel had to wait for him to get back from his trip? That's right. Yeah. I couldn't just go out and find someone else. These are the sort of things you train for for a long time. I didn't have an alternative for him. You think I made the right call? If you got away with it. Sorry? If you got away with it. That's the test. If I got away with it, I could have gotten away with it and it would still be wrong. What do you think? I won't tell you. What do they teach you? Do they teach you to use weapons? They teach you how to, uh, <laughs> how to hold a knife between your teeth? <laughs> No, not at all. Not at all. I, I know that uh, part of the image of a Mossad agent is the guy with the knife in his teeth, the James Bond with the sophisticated weapons. The most dangerous thing that can happen is if they catch you with a weapon in a country where you're not supposed to be. And so... You wouldn't walk around carrying a weapon. Your weapon is your identity. It's your story. You don't have any other weapon. In the movies, uh, the lives of the operatives and the secret agents are very glamorous. In reality, it's true that there are some insane peaks and there are uh, some unforgettable moments. But before you reach that peak, there's a tremendous amount of repetitive and unglamorous work. Very hard work. You can sometimes sit for four days in front of an office building and wait to see if the bearded guy you are there to watch is going to come out. You don't have uh, the ability to do anything else. If you look away from that building, you'll miss it and the bearded guy will get away. That's the reality. Reality isn't James Bond. Now, the James Bond part is there, but it comes at the very end. And it's very small. You can end up working a whole week for 10 minutes of action. But you know, I won't give examples, but there are many things worth working at for a week to get 10 minutes. <laughs> I started working right around the Yom Kippur War. Tensions were running very high. There was real fear for the destruction of Israel. Where did they send you? To Egypt, during the war. So how did you get there? I got back to Europe to reorganize, to build my new identity because my entire time in Israel had to be erased, including any connections to Judaism, to Israel, to Hebrew. Okay, these are pictures of um, the evening gowns of the 70s that I occasionally used. Who chose those gowns? The commander. Yeah. We went shopping. Three gowns. Okay, this was on the plane, on the way to start the missions. That was my 22nd birthday. Who took the picture? Was there anybody with you? Yeah. I had a partner with me because the mission required a couple. Yes. And that was your cover story? His wife. The day I arrived in Cairo, I was um, with that same boyfriend, and he wanted to show me around town, to show me Cairo by night, and he took me to Sahara City. A large tent, music, food, belly dancer. He was already there for a period of time before I joined him. And I saw him, like, tapping his foot to the rhythm with his hand on his leg. For me, that was the sign that he already felt at home there, that he was part of the culture. For me, it was all completely foreign. 
I was playing a certain character. For example? I'd be playing a blonde, but I'm a brunette. The blonde is the... a shallow person. I'd only be interested in a bit of sports and a bit of social life and a bit of... of learning belly dancing. It shapes your figure and it connects you to the local culture. I'm very aware of what I'm transmitting on the outside and of what I want people to see in me because those two women who are going to gossip about me would have had to supply their own answers to their questions without asking me. If they came and asked me, it means I screwed up big time. I constructed the story in advance, of course. Who and what I was, where I came from, but there are always the small details that you're not... You can't memorize somebody else's entire life, real or not real. You have to invent a life, but there's always, always a few missing parts. You deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis, and it becomes second nature to pay attention, to watch your step, not to talk, not to give anything away. Essentially, your entire life became an act. Yes, that's true, a theater of life. So for a person that doesn't, doesn't enjoy the game, then it's not for him, obviously. But if you're enjoying the game, and... I remember when I went alone on a plane to fly to Khartoum for the first time. You get on the airplane and you're surrounded by Muslim men wearing headscarves and they look at you and you look at them and you know they haven't got the faintest clue that you actually... where you're from. I sat on the plane and looked around and enjoyed it so much that, that I had a secret they didn't, they didn't know about. During the operation in Sudan, what was your cover story? A businessman? No, I wasn't a businessman. I was a researcher, an anthropologist, a researcher of tribes. And it wasn't easy because I didn't... Uh, there weren't many of them around. Let's just say that. There was a director that came down from the prime minister himself, and he simply said, bring the Ethiopian Jews back here. The situation in Ethiopia at the time was one of near anarchy. And so Ethiopia was not considered a viable exit point for the Jews. So we thought to take advantage of the fact that Sudan and the state of Israel both had beaches in the Red Sea. This operation required us to break all the rules that usually apply to an intelligence operation. First of all, it involved field activity in an area where our intelligence gathering capability was extremely limited. And secondly, we had no way of actually knowing whether we had been compromised or not. The men we recruited, we didn't have time to thoroughly train them to do the job we were asking them to do. I made that decision. We used a shortcut. We took people, including Israelis, and we trained them in high-pressure crash courses um, to operate under foreign identity in an enemy country. So I arrived in Sudan in order to have a look at the beaches, to have a look at the scene in general. We went out for preliminary reconnaissance of the beach, and during the reconnaissance, about 65 to 70 kilometers north of Port Sudan, we saw a few structures with red roofs. There was an Italian company that had built a resort for divers. This place has the world's most beautiful diving locations. The moment I saw this resort, I realized the full potential it had. It was our justification for being in Sudan. So what does a diving resort have to do with you? How do you explain it? Okay, so I'm an anthropologist. I'm fed up with anthropology. I'm, I've been going around this country for two years now. I've never seen a place so beautiful. And that's it. I know now. 
I just finished my research here and now I want to make some money. That's the universal language. The crew I recruited for this job had to, on the one hand, play the part of a diving instructor to the hilt, meaning being able to instruct for real, to be part of an operational crew that would do the job of um, gathering the Jews or transporting them, and all this while being undercover. No Jew went through that resort. We evacuated them through some inlet that was five kilometers from the resort. The resort's only function was to provide us with our cover. Well, I was a troublemaker. I got recruited as a reporter. And in the Mossad, a reporter is just another word for whore. And to be honest, my entire adult life was a combination of reporting and Mossad work, reporting and Mossad work, reporting, and sometimes both at the same time. What was your job during this operation? I was one of the people who started the resort. Among other things, I was a windsurfing instructor, a boat operator. At some point, we brought in the first sailboard ever to be seen in Sudan. We brought it in directly from Israel in a Hercules plane. At the end of the course, that was really the first time in my life when I knew what I was going to do. My job was to manage the resort as if it was a club med. This resort would serve as a cover and an alibi for the operatives to come to Sudan. One of them would serve as the resort's doctor, one will serve as the accountant, you asked me if what we were doing was like the theater. There you go. That was my moment on the stage. The resort was called Orus. Once the operation was completed, the New York Times wrote that it was such a pity the resort closed because it was such a pearl in the world of diving. It had the most beautiful diving spots and divers from all over the world flocked to it and also the food. It was so good, you would have thought that we were running a two Michelin star quality restaurant. The operation took place in tandem with the activities of the resort. They were completely separate. The resort didn't interrupt its routine during the operation. A few of the operations were done by sea, meaning we brought the brothers, that's what we called them, to the beach, and there the men of Shayatet 13 took them. At some point, we encountered an ambush by the Sudanese army. Sixty Sudanese soldiers suddenly emerged from the dark. Soldiers? Soldiers armed with AK-47s. There were gunshots. Some of the guys got captured. You got captured? No, I stayed back about 100 meters or so from the beach in an inflatable boat and recorded to the rear because the Shayatet squad was already preparing for a violent rescue operation, right? Preparing to get back to the beach and rescue the four guys that were captured. And then I said, hold on, because I suddenly saw Danny drop his hands and start to yell at the officer. And he's a tall, strong man and he starts shouting at me in Arabic, and I understand what he's saying, but I answer him in English. He tells me, what's going on? What are you doing? Who are these people? I'm taking you to Port Sudan. He grabbed me by my hand here, I jerked my hand free, and I told him, I'm not going anywhere with you. You're shouting? I'm shouting too. He started shouting at him. You're a moron. You're an idiot. I work for the tourist ministry. I take tourists out for night dives and you're shouting at me? Tomorrow I'm going to Khartoum to lodge a complaint with the chief of staff. And the officer was taken aback. He mumbled an apology, gathered his platoon, and everyone left. That was in our mind the entire time, that it could end with a burned Hercules plane and all of us hanging by our legs from its tail. Was there any moment where you felt that your true identity had been compromised? 
I had a very difficult challenge because it was a time when we didn't have many guests and two German guests arrived, both German. One of them had a crush on me, so he followed me everywhere, was around me all the time and talked to me and asked me questions and we spoke about our childhood or about songs and just like when you have a normal conversation you would have with someone who's from the same place you are. You feel very uncomfortable with people like that. It's as if someone else is masquerading as an Israeli. You'd know immediately if he's for real or if he learned it someplace else. Diving tourists are people who spend a lot of money in order to reach any nook and cranny where people say, this is a spot. So we had Italians and French and Spanish and Canadians. There was a Canadian fellow, a Jewish guy, by the way, and he asked for a private dive. The instructor was someone who kept his cover. He was an officer, uh, previously from Shayatet 13. Now, underwater during a dive, there are universal signals between divers, but army men have different signals. If the instructor asks you if everything's all right, he goes like this. And you have to answer him like this. In the army, he goes like this. And you have to answer like this. The most difficult thing for them was to make that switch. So this fellow was from a country with a respected Navy commando. And he uh, told him, why are you making that signal? What? What's your background? He realized the mistake and he said, yeah, I served in the army in the past. When they got out of the water, this fellow says something to him like, it was good, eh? In Hebrew. And the other guy, you know, you spend more than an hour underwater, you're a little, um... So he tells him, yeah. He came over to me and said, my cover's blown. I said, okay, which room is he at? He gave me the room number. I knocked on the door, he opened it, and started talking to me in Hebrew. I said to him, I don't understand. So he switched to English. Then he tells me, look, I'm with you guys. I said to him, you asked for another dive tonight, correct? You asked for a night dive. I'll take you to a reef where there's a specific type of shark. They only like kosher meat. That's where you'll be diving tonight. No, he tells me. No, I, I didn't mean to. I didn't. I'm really... I, I'm, I love Israel. I told him, I don't care. You just need to remember that we have a wide reach. Very wide. So what do you do in a situation like this? Well, in this job, you always prefer to avoid violence. But the objective was to prevent the capture of those Jews or the capture of the commando operatives. And? You see, there's, there are diving accidents. You want me to tell you that I slept comfortably during those years? No. I knew that something might happen at any given moment. They'd get compromised, the Sudanese would catch on to what's happening, and from the moment they get taken into custody, anything could happen to them, from torturing them to making sure they won't reach Israel alive. That image of Eli Cohen hanged in the city center in Damascus, isn't that something that haunts you? No. No. Because if it did, I would be paralyzed. Not me, and not anyone else. On all levels. No. The missions were for gathering intelligence. I saw an opportunity to bring back intelligence that I knew was very sought after back home. I joined a certain trip. I was able to get to the War Museum in Suez and to photograph vehicles and tools in order to help find missing persons whose fates were unknown. Over there I saw the bloodstains that were still fresh. It was just a few days after the soldiers were killed there. And I had to keep smiling, as if everything was fine. You look so young in those photos. 
and you managed to, to hide your emotions. There were many moments like that. I'll give you an example. A foreigner was not allowed to travel alone on most of the roads. And I was traveling with a partner on a dark road at night, and there wasn't really a good explanation for why we were there. And what you see is what you can bring back. It could be hideouts for long-range missiles. It could be antennas. It could be all sorts of things. And we arrived at a police checkpoint. The officer approaches my window and asks where we're coming from. So I tell him. So he asks where we're heading to, and I tell him. And then he says, why? So uh, I played stupid and opened my eyes wide and said, because the other place was really boring. He bought it and let us go. There were many tense moments. Because we had stuff in the car we really didn't want anyone to find. You were involved in a mishap uh, as a team leader in an operation in a European country, let's just say. I'll tell you, regarding the mishap that you just mentioned, uh, that I was involved in, uh, I was involved in much more than just one mishap. Only usually, usually, you manage to fix the mishap, so they're not considered mishaps. But in all operations, in all operations, we take a measure of risk. And once in a blue moon, we get screwed. How was the experience of being in custody as a personal experience? Being a free man, king of the world, who plays with the world as if it's his own personal playground, someone who moves, travels, flies, and, and lives in some sort of... to suddenly find yourself in a heartbeat, cuffed, cuffed to a chair. A very unpleasant situation, really. And then you start asking yourself the big questions. I confess that I even asked myself, why do we need to die for this thing? And the preparation and the your training makes you put that aside at that moment so you can move forward. And they believed you? You managed to keep your cover story intact? Of course. You see, the dangers were obvious. At that time, there was the Lillehammer incident. The Mossad went after the person responsible for the murder of the athletes in Munich. A Moroccan waiter was mistakenly identified as this person. And it resulted in... Uh, they killed the wrong guy. One of them was Sylvia Raphael. You knew her in the Mossad before that? Yes. Part of my character's identity were the abilities of a reporter or a news photographer. And that's when I met Sylvia, who was in that field. Sylvia Raphael came from South Africa. She wasn't even Jewish. She liked Israel very much, and at some point she got recruited. And they constructed a marvelous cover story for her as a Canadian photographer. She really was a photographer. Who did she photograph? The who's who of the Middle East, including kings and rulers. So there was a Mossad female agent at the courts of kings in the Middle East with a camera. 
In the course of the existence of the State of Israel, there were uh, a few dozen Israelis who traveled around in places that, how shall we put it, no Hollywood screenwriter could consume enough hallucinogenic mushrooms to come up with stories like these. She got outed as a Mossad agent and she was sent to jail. I watched her sentence uh, from my, uh, my place at Cairo at that time. Does it go through your mind? What could happen to you if they catch you? Uh, getting caught in Norway is not the same as getting caught in Cairo. All the fun we had notwithstanding, we were being tested. We had guessed that, I mean, short of wearing a headband that said we're the CIA, they were CIA for sure. We spotted them right away. We knew that if we behaved in an irresponsible way, we could blow the whole operation. There is something a bit trippy, knowing that while we're having fun at the resort, enjoying ourselves and dancing with guests that are having a party that night, right behind the resort, there's a convoy of covert military vehicles which are simultaneously transporting Jews to an evacuation zone. Whenever I saw a group of Jews getting further away from the beach on the boats of the Sheyatet or climbing up in the air with the Hercules, that gave me huge satisfaction. The fact of the matter is that this whole thing, with its ups and downs and with all kinds of setbacks, including people getting shot, including arrests, anything you can think of, it was an operation that went on for 10 years. Your cover story in Cairo was his wife. How do you keep such a complex relationship going for so long? I'd rather go on to the next question. And still, how does it impact you to pretend to be in such a close relationship? Where do you draw the line between what's real and what's not, between the acting and reality? Wherever you want. And in your case? Let's start by saying I wasn't that fond of the guy. If I met him socially, I guarantee I wouldn't have spent more than five minutes with him. He was a total opposite of the person that I could uh, see myself being in a relationship with. How were you able to keep it up for a whole year? You were only 22. Uh, it's not like acting in a play every night and then stepping off the stage after 90 minutes. I usually live in a very total, very intense way. I mean, if I'm involved with something, then I'm involved with it all the way through. There's no doubt that being together for many months in an enemy country, with all the tensions built into it, with the to trust one another and the acting side of it, it caused us to get close to each other, a closeness that turned into intimacy. In that situation, it was obvious it was going to be very hard if there was not going to be anything between us. Because of our living conditions, because of the fact that we had uh, servants that were living in the house, and we needed to create this chemistry, this intimacy. We said, let's try doing it for real. until the mission came to an end and then we had to decide do we stay together or go our separate ways 
The person that introduced us and knew both of us very well saw himself as responsible for the impossible situation we found ourselves in. And he thought that it shouldn't be allowed to continue the way it was. And he separated us. Yeah. And you just accepted it? I was very, very angry. <laughs> I was. Very angry. Very much so. I came and I said, listen, maybe it's a mistake, but it's my mistake. And I would like you to, um, to not interfere with my life anymore. <sighs> At the same time, my partner could have done what I did and said, wait a minute, time out. I'm not going to do it. Let's, uh, let's do what we want to do. And he didn't do it. And so... Um, the person who made that decision was probably right that we shouldn't have stayed together. It's not easy. Ultimately, these are humans. It's not as if you can just do it in... It needs to be, it's very obvious that you have your working life where you are one person and then there is your home life where you're another, different person. You can't mix the two up or else it's very bad. Sometimes it gets mixed up and it's very bad. So you put a stop to it. There's no other way. A few months before the operation was over, I remember we walked on the beach. It was dusk. His name over there was Tony. I said to him, Tony, tell me, who do you think you like better? Tony or his real name back in Israel? And both of us were not able to answer this question. Who would we rather be? The people we were there in Sudan or the people we were over there in Israel? Once I went with my wife to the U.S., an American couple asked me, where are you from? And instinctively I said, we're from Italy. And it went on from there. It was rather easy feeding them all kinds of details about Italy. After we got back to our room, my wife says to me, why didn't you tell them you're from Israel? Why did you say you're from Italy? The point is that in this job, you're never free of the need to be protected, to stay undercover, to not get exposed. I conditioned myself to never respond whenever I heard Hebrew in airports. And then it got me into a very awkward, very difficult situation where I was having a vacation with my daughter in Europe. And she calls me in the airport, Mommy, and I'm not moving a muscle. It's part of staying undercover. It's, it's what you're supposed to do to behave like it has nothing to do with you. My daughter remembers that to this day, and she's 35 years old. I too remember it to this day. <laughs> <laughs> 